Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Front pages as usual. The Sunday Times May flies into new Chinese security row. I've been talking about that with her and a lot about that in today's papers. Um, Sunday Express, the spies in Mrs. May's bedroom. This is a suggestion the Chinese have got so many cameras in the bedrooms used by the incoming leaders that they're going to have to get undressed underneath the duvet in order to avoid exposing themselves to the gaze of all China. Um, then this is the other big story today. The Labour MP Keith Vaz, who's a very, very important chair of one of the key select committees, um, has been accused in a sting of being involved with prostitutes uh, and he has apparently uh, resigned, at least for the time being, from that job this morning. He has referred the matter to his lawyers, but it's a huge story and we'll, I'm sure be talking a bit about that. Finally, I think the most depressing headline of the Sunday. The Sunday Telegraph gives us modern life is killing children. It's all about cancer uh, rates and pollution, but it seems pretty, pretty grim. I'm sure we could find more important and interesting things to talk about. Uh, Ian Martin, let's start off with the G20. You've chosen the Observer. It's a very, very important moment for the government and for Theresa May, this. It is, and she's back from her summer walking in the Swiss Alps. And it's a, it is a very important moment because Team May have waited a long time for her debut on the international stage, and it's the first summit after Brexit. And you get a little bit of an indication of how things might be different that she, uh, as Toby Hellman, the Observer, tells us, she's having bilaterals with the US, with China, Russia and India, but no equivalent meetings with um, EU leaders. And that's a, a bit of an indication of, uh, that British she's foreign policy... In a direction. She's looking in a different direction. She's going to have to because of uh, the vote. The big problem, I suppose, that she's got, the immediate problem, is the Hinkley Point investment, because the Chinese are very, very keen on this, and then building a new nuclear reactor from scratch at Bradwell. But her own private secretary, Nick Timothy, has said that he doesn't like the idea of a communist country having eyes and ears inside our ele electricity it, system. It's extremely tricky, but I think there's something, I think there's something rather admirable about, uh, about this, actually, that she is at least taking her time. She hasn't rushed into this stuff, and... It's, a, it's an indication of how her style is going to be quite different from Cameron and Osborne. Gillian, you've got more on this, I think, from the, the papers Yes, as I mean, well. if you understand, want to understand the challenge she faces, on the one hand, they want trade relations with China, and Hinkley Point is part of that whole reach towards the east. On the other hand, you have intelligence services warning repeatedly of the security issues. I mean, today we have from the Sunday Mirror the undercover prime minister talking about the problems mm -hmm. of the Chinese spying Hangzhou at the G20 summit. We've got Beware China's Sexy Honey Trap Spies, G20 officials are warned in the Sunday Telegraph. And there is growing concern about the ability of the Chinese to essentially yeah. provide almost, if you like, a new Cold War. And surely if you're Theresa May, with her political background, having been one of the most, I suppose, in a way, successful, long-serving Home Secretaries, aren't you going to have an instinct to put security first, even even at times above trade, it's, it's in a, a really calculation of this kind. If she says to the Chinese, we're pulling the plug on these nuclear power stations, that will be seen as an absolutely mm. humiliating moment from President Xi mm. and very, very bad for our relationships. After all that work that George Osborne was doing, going over to China and being nice to them for so long. But I think she will uh, be guided here by her understanding of what's termed the Five Eyes relationship, mm. the intelligence sharing yeah. relationship. And I think that will steer her towards a pivot towards Australia, the US, uh, Canada and New Zealand. Obviously that comes with difficulties in terms of trade and um, still yeah. wants to trade with, uh, trade with China, but her attitude to China is going to be very, very different to that of George Osborne particularly. And certainly the issue right now of cyber security is at the top of everyone's mind and just to com make things even more complicated, it's not just China's involved in cyber security today, it's Russia as well. Mm. Um, so it's a difficult world. Now, one of those slightly odd moments, Shami, mm. um, I did an interview with Theresa May, and it's appeared in the newspapers. Yes. She's not going to go for an election until 2020. Well, congratulations, because obviously <laughs> this is the interview that everyone is talking about um, today, and she has said it would seem unequivocally. We'll, we'll watch it in there a bit. Will, well, you'll see. There yeah. will be no mm. snap election. Of course, it isn't really a snap election if you say there will be one. So, they, you know... So what, what is a snap election is an issue. Yeah, so, so maybe, I don't know, circumstances could change in the future subject to Brexit negotiations and so on. But I, but I do think that it's very much in her character as a politician to be 
stability first, yeah. safe she, pair of hands. She's the person who is trying to stop the ship of state rocking I'm not too the much. showboat. She's mm. said so many times, I don't tour the tea rooms and the TV studios. Yeah. I get on with the work. People are trusting in me at this moment of crisis, and I will steady the ship uh, even above personal interest. That I mean, she's grappling with so much uncertainty right now, and the business community is so worried about the uncertainty. I think she's trying to give an indication that we're steady as we go. This is the one part of the timetable that people yes. do know about. And they're very conscious of the parallel with what happened to Labour in 2007 and the mess that... Gordon you, Brown again. Which you remember very well addressing maybe. the nation. <laughs> yes. Um, that was you and, again, and he said wasn't he it? hadn't been looking at the polls. Exactly. And he wasn't going to call the general election. Things went downhill for him after that. And the mistake he had made was to essentially sacrifice Yes. and risk his strongest card and Theresa May's strongest card is that she's the steadying figure as, as so she you said. picked up a piece that Andrew Rawnsley has written in the Observer suggesting she's not quite as strong as she seems yeah it's a great uh, column actually it's talking about her vulnerabilities and just reminding everyone really that every Prime Minister almost every Prime Minister gets this honeymoon phase in which the polls look fantastic and the British are conditioned to give new leaders a mm. chance but I always think that you, early on in a prime minister's um, tenure, you very often see glimmers of what is eventually going to do them in. <laughs> and I think if there is a, I think if there is a, if, I think if there is a flaw, there's a tendency on the part of her and her team to uh, to a certain paranoia, and that could turn into control for Igor. And that, to that end, it seems clear that they are attempting to run every single media request, interview request, lunch request, which horrifies uh, journalists, all being passed through uh, number 10. Mm. The reality is this is, it, this it, is tried it, time and again. It never, say, ever every prime works. Minister tries like the Obama clamp. presidency, Does yes. It? I mean, been trying to every prime minister here yes. tries to the clamp down on lunches and within a year, <laughs> they're back to the same Because the, pro business. the problem yeah. is, is that politics has too many moving parts. There it's do. full of hundreds of ambitious people. Shami, right mm -hmm. at the start, I mentioned that you had been in the, in the newspapers yourself because you have taken a seat, or you accepted the offer of a seat in the House of Lords. You're not Lady Chakrabarti mm -hmm. or whatever. Do you know what you're going to be yet, by the way? Chakrabarti is still my name. Yes, Lady Chakrabarti. You're, you're not Lady Chakrabarti. And you name. don't want to be Lady You're a lady well, and you're Chakrabarti, but you're not Lady Chakrabarti yet. Not, now, no. the criticism was made that, is that you were offered this job and you did a, another job for Jeremy Corbyn looking at racism and anti-Semitism in the Labour Party and that therefore there was at least the perception of a clear conflict of interest. Oh, look, it's not been the summer of love in the Labour Party or in British politics uh, more generally. Yes, lots of mud has been slung about. It mm. was transactional, etc., etc. I wrote a whitewash. I did not. I know what it's like to be offered transactional favours by, <laughs> by prime ministers, but, um, you know, not by beleaguered leaders of, of the Labour Party. I, I wrote a report, I believe... I would like to say, tell every... me more, but I don't think well, you're going to. I'm not, but, but, I, but I wrote, I mean, a, I wrote a report to try and civilise discourse in the Labour Party. I've yet to completely succeed in that... Um, in that enterprise, but I, but I stand by it. And to be clear, you weren't offered a peerage before you no. did the report. No. That happened afterwards, yes. so there, was, there, there wasn't a quid quo it was quo. after the, It was after the Brexit, after the report, after uh, as a resignation yeah. in the resignation honours. And uh, were there any discussions about going to the Lords before the report was done? Jeremy Corbyn is not a corrupt man, and I am not a corrupt woman. I stand by the report. There was nothing remotely transactional about this. OK. Um, another uh, question is, why would you want to go to the House of Lords in the first place? I mean, you know, you're a national name, you've got a platform around, uh, around the country for the issues that you care about. What's it about the Lords that's attractive? I would have thought there's a lot that's very unattractive about the House of Lords. Of, of course, but it is our second legislative chamber. Mm. And I feel that our country is in probably the most difficult moment of my lifetime. Uh, and the lifetimes of lots of other people. It is the second legislative chamber. There will be Brexit legislation going through that house. There will be issues about protecting people's rights and freedoms in this difficult moment. If I can do a little bit of yes. something to, to help, I'll, I'll do my best. If I was Jeremy Corbyn, unlikely thought, I would probably say to Shami Chakrabarti in due course, come into the shadow cabinet, maybe as shadow justice secretary or something. Would you take that kind of job? I think he's got a, a leadership election to, to win before anything like that. Okay. Um, do you think this has damaged your reputation at all? When people sling mud at you, it is designed to damage your reputation, but I haven't done anything really in, in my working life for reputation. I'm, I'm, I'm doing my best to make a difference. Okay. Well, let's move on to somebody who has had a bit of a, 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 a grim morning, Keith Vaz, across two front pages, as I saw, 
Now, Ian Martin, this is, uh, seems like some kind of sting operation. We don't absolutely know if he's resigned from his position as chair of the committee. That's what the Mail on Sunday said, but we've got no independent confirmation of that. Let's tell us, first of all, why this is a legitimate and important story. Well, it's, it has a clear public interest because of his role uh, in terms of the Home Affairs Select Committee and the the subjects which have been examined, which are directly related They're to this. They're inquiring into prostitution, prostitution and drug use. Class A drugs. Uh, and if it is suggested or proved that um, he's voted in a particular way that is in line with his interests, then that's obviously going to be a problem for him. But it's yes. unclear whether he's resigned uh, or not yet. I can't see much hypocrisy, given his public positions in what has happened, but I can see it's obviously very, very embarrassing and it's very embarrassing. terrible for the family. It's very and he is a big, big public figure, isn't he? He is. But there is, as I said, a clear... It might be regarded by some people as distasteful. It is certainly an old-fashioned okay. Fleet Street uh, operation, but uh, the public interest defences very, very clear in this case. And there wasn't even a news to the world to get involved this time. Let's move to a, cheerf a more cheerful yes. political story. I think it brought a smile to everybody's faces, if not possibly Yvette Cooper, Ed Balls' wife. You've got the, are you the Express there? The I've got the Sunday Express, and as you say, a happier, a happier story. Ed Balls, strictly Ed Balls. Um, um, wearing a shirt, amazing shirt. Wearing an amazing shirt, and, and, and moving on with his, um, his formidable career. Um, possibly reaching um, more people, new audiences than he's, than he's ever done before. He also has a book mm -hmm. out, and I know that yeah. you're going to be talking to him it's in a bit. It's rather a good book, actually. And they, yeah, well, maybe yeah. some people will watch Strictly and then go and have a they look go, at his book. Look um, at the book. The real question, I suppose that one of the questions in this is politicians seem to be kind of blown out of the system, younger and younger and younger. Mm. I mean, Ed Balls is a relatively young guy. As the book shows, he's made lots of mistakes, but actually he's got experience. And uh, I wonder whether these people shouldn't be coming back into politics when they can. Well, one of the questions is, do, are we actually a culture which celebrates reinvention and learning from your mistakes mm. and having a second chance? Historically, the UK has been very bad at that. Yes. But it'd be nice to think that's changing a bit, because heavens only knows we need some grey hairs, some people with experience. I think we probably like do. Like us. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Now, um, in terms of political stories that have a big... Um, private aspect. A rather sad story. Nicola Sturgeon, all across the front page of the Sunday Times, she's given an interview and there's a book about her, and she had a miscarriage. Yes, and you know... Some nasty is... people have attacked her for putting her career ahead of having a family, and here we get the true story. The story of Nicola Sturgeon is fascinating because she cuts the core of a big issue, which is that we have more women than ever before on the political stage globally, and yet the question of how they handle the motherhood issue, how they handle their personal life is critical. She has very bravely come out and admitted that she had a miscarriage a few years ago, that she's not childless by choice, and that's not only very useful in terms of opening the debate on this very painful issue that affects so many women, mm. but it also raises the question of if she'd been a man who'd mm. had to admit that actually he wanted children and wasn't able to, would he have had the yes. same issues in public life? I suspect not. So, frankly, I salute her for doing Absolutely. this. And it shows that she has an ability to both show leadership and, her human and side. be human and, and, and connect with people. Yeah. And this yeah. happened just before the election. It's a very difficult time for her. And I think it happened in public at a commemoration at Ibrox in Glasgow. Absolutely. So it could not have been more painful. Yes. But whatever your politics, you can't help but admire Nicola right. Sturgeon as and a role model to young, young girls, women. Exactly. Yeah. Looking at the story of a leader, female leader should be inspired. Ian, we've talked a lot about books. You've got a book out about yeah. the Big Bang. And what worry, what's interests me about all of this is that, you know, that great uh, revolution in the financial services industries unleashed by Nigel Lawson in the early 1980s. Some people would say that what we are living through now, all the troubles that we have now, go back to that. That's where the unregulated city, or the, the poorly regulated city, the big bucks, the risk-taking all started, which led, of course, to the financial crash mm. and to the politics that we are in now. I think it's, uh, yeah, I mean, that... That's one of the reasons that I wrote the book. It's called Crash Bang Wallop, and it's the 30th anniversary of Big Bang coming up this autumn. I think it had an impact beyond the dry world of the city. I think it had an enormous cultural impact in terms of how Loads we... Loads of money, big spending. Exactly. What, how we value success, how, how we measure success, how we value the connection between the generations, because a lot of took, people took the money and ran. Um, so it's, I think it was a very, very significant cultural moment. Shami, you're going to be joining me later on, but Ian and Gillian in particular, thank you all very much indeed for that.